you can raise your hand if you are already a DSA member. Okay. And now, can you raise your hand if you are not yet a DSA member? Wow. Let's, that's amazing. That is truly amazing. I am so excited to be here today, and I, I want to really talk to you about my journey with, with DSA, with this organization, and how I came to become a member of this organization and came to this point where I'm standing in front of all of you. So like some of you, my journey in organizing and my journey in politics began with Palestine. It was and continues to be something that I deeply care about. I came to this country when I was seven years old, and as soon as I got to any kind of level of political consciousness, the contradiction around Palestine struck me, that we claimed to hold these universal ideals, and then when it came to applying them to Palestinians, we drew a line in the sand. We said we cared about freedom, we cared about justice, we cared about safety, we cared about peace even, and yet we did not dare to apply those things to Palestine. And I'm gonna date myself in saying this, but I, I used to argue on Facebook walls. I don't know if, how many people here remember Facebook walls. But I used to go back and forth with a friend of mine who felt equally passionate, but from the completely different vantage point. And each time I would research my response and I would feel like this time I really got him. This is the time where he's gonna hit me back and be like, you are totally right. You are totally right. They are counting how many calories are allowed to come through the blockade. They are doing that. And yet each time he felt the same way about whatever he was, he was gonna write back to me on my wall. And so when I got to college, I decided that this idea I had been fed about don't preach to the choir, instead argue with those on the other side, that there may be a flaw in that, that we may in fact first need to organize the choir. And so when I got to college, I co-founded my school's first Students for Justice in Palestine. And that, began my organizing journey and my understanding of how power works and how you can actually get people from consciousness to action. And it was that commitment that first introduced me to this organization. Because when I came back to New York City, the city that I had grown up in, I had participated in electoral campaigns of young Muslim progressives who were running for office. And eventually I heard of a Palestinian Lutheran minister which is a set of words that makes a racist's mind explode. <laughs> but a Palestinian Lutheran minister by the name of Khadr El Yatim was running for city council in Bay Ridge. And I remember reading that article and I decided that this had to become my life. I had to do everything I could to get on this campaign. And it was in that campaign that I first met New York City DSA in the real sense of the people in this room. And I met this organization, and what stood out to me about DSA was that DSA meant what it said. That it wasn't just empty rhetoric. That this was an organization that understood a fight for a worker here is the same fight for a worker anywhere. And whatever our brothers and sisters deserve in our own neighborhood is what every person deserves everywhere and a complete opposition to drawing any line in the sand about anyone. And so after that campaign, I decided I had to join DSA. And so I took that first step. And I ended up becoming a member of Queens DSA. Do we have anyone from Queens in the house? I actually was on the subway platform on my way to get here and I met a constituent of mine who said they were coming to this for the first time. So a big round of applause wherever you may be. And I joined DSA, and you know, the first time I went to a Queen's DSA meeting around electoral politics, there were, I think, nine, eight or nine of us in a room in Astoria. And I ended up running, and I'm going to now say a number of words that if you're not a member of this organization will sound like absolute gibberish. But I ended up running to be on the organizing committee of the electoral working group of Queen's DSA. And what that means in English is that I became one of the leaders of our branch for local elections. And there were a number of us, and our, we had just come off of winning the fight against Amazon's attempt to build a headquarters in Western Queens. 
many filling, filling a church just like this one all those years ago in Astoria. And my first big campaign in being a member of the organizing committee was to be one of the leads for our organization in Tiffany Caban's run for District Attorney of Queens. And it was an incredible race, one where we came within 60 votes of winning a race to represent more than two million people. And it was a race that exemplified all that is so exciting about DSA. That this is a place where we find expertise in each other. We do not wait to be told by some consultant or political class as to how we can win or how we can even contest elections. And so many of us, many of whom are in this room still today, gave everything we had to that campaign. We're talking about, you know, you wake up at five in the morning to go for GOTV on election day and you're out for 15 hours that day to try and make sure that everyone who can vote will vote. And at the end of that campaign, where we lost by, I think it was 55 votes, a friend of mine who I had grown close to over the course of our organizing asked me to run for state assembly. It was at a Queen's DSA electoral working group meeting. And the answer I gave to him was that I would think about it, and I made a few calls to people that I respected, to mentors, to people who had really brought me into the world of New York City politics. And eventually I said yes, and we ran that campaign in 2020. We faced an opponent who spent more than two and a half times as much money as we had. We had the support practically was from this organization and a few others who were willing to take a brave stand. And despite all the obstacles in front of us, we won that race in 2020 in June. And, and I have spent the last four years being a DSA elected official. And what that means is continuing to have that same understanding of finding the answers in each other, of empowering New Yorkers beyond those who are part of City Hall or Albany or whatever it may be, to understand the course that we have to chart. And in that time, I have stood alongside DSA members who began the fight to defeat a fracked gas power plant in our neighborhood where we defeated the eighth largest carbon emitter in the country and their proposal to pollute the air of our neighborhood. We, I stood alongside taxi drivers, one of whom I saw actually walk in here as we were starting this conversation, to finally stand up for debt relief for an industry that had been decimated by city government, an industry that had been let down a path to debt peonage for thousands of working class taxi drivers who'd been promised a middle class life. And I got arrested with them, countless days of rallies and protests, and eventually took part in a 15 day hunger strike. And on November 3rd of 2021, we won and we won more than $450 million in debt relief for thousands of working class taxi drivers. <laughs> and the, the last example I wanna give you is about this organization, where we launched a campaign called Fix the MTA for reasons that are plainly obvious. <laughs> and we were thinking, we were having all these meetings, what is it that we should foreground as our demands that we should talk about as the things that working people deserve. And I had a meeting with a DSA member who is sitting right over there. Alicia, I'm, I'm not, is that a, okay, yeah, well, I just, you know, I should have asked you before I did that. Um, and Alicia said, why don't you have free buses as part of your platform? And that is now one of the things that I am most known for an idea that my comrade had. And that is what typifies this organization. Yes, there are co-chairs, there are candidates, there are elected officials, there are leaders of all sorts, but the beauty of this organization comes from the rank and file spirit of this organization. And so I want you to know that when you come here into this church tonight, what you are doing is joining, potentially, an organization 
that believes that you could have the very answer to the questions that are being asked. Because I think for far too long we have waited for elites of all kinds to tell us what we are supposed to do, when in fact they're too busy benefiting from the status quo to come up with any kind of alternative to it. And the answers actually lie in these pews as opposed to from these politicians, except for myself and other DSA-endorsed politicians. <laughs> and before I speak a little bit more about what, what this mayoral campaign will look like, I do want to ask each and every one of you to look at the sheet that you have in your hands and to join DSA. Because the strength of these movements, the strength of these wins, whether it's defeating NRG, whether it's fighting alongside the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, whether it's winning the first free bus pilot in New York City history, and increasing ridership by 30%, decreasing assaults on bus operators by nearly 40%, taking 11% of new riders out of cars and onto public transit, those are wins that I would never have been able to be a part of were it not for this organization being a part of them and sometimes even creating the fights in the first place. So I ask you to consider being a part of this organization because its strength comes from each and every one of you. And there are so many of us who have had incredible ideas, but we too know that the time is coming for us to pass the torch to the next generation of members so that we can finally make New York City politics look more like New York City itself. Not just in terms of how, not just in terms of representation, but in terms of the concerns that people are feeling in an everyday level. Because if people don't see their pain recognized, and if they don't see it rectified in any of the proposals you're putting forward, why should they come out and vote? And it's up to us to finally answer that call. So that is my pitch to join DSA. And And I say all of this amidst a race to be New York City's next mayor. And these two things are interlinked in that they share a commitment to put the working class at the center of our politics. It is time that we listen to what our neighbors are actually saying. I spent a good part of my Sunday on Fordham Road in the Bronx and on Hillside Avenue in Queens, two neighborhoods that had some of the largest swings towards Trump and even larger drop-offs in voting overall. And I asked New Yorkers, what was it that led them to either vote this way or not vote at all? And what I heard time and time again was that they could not afford, they could not afford their day-to-day -day life and yet they were being told that the economy was good. And when they looked at the ballot, they saw there was only one candidate in their eyes that was telling them that they could make life more affordable, that they could literally have cheaper groceries, that they could go back to a time when they remember having more money in their pocket. And that despair was coupled with a despair that I heard from many about the genocide in Gaza and a feeling that while they couldn't afford their day-to-day -day life, here this government somehow had $18 billion and more to afford killing children halfway across the world. And I think it is time that we answer the call of this despair. Because if we do not, someone else will. If we do not, any alternative will start to shimmer. And we have seen how that is possible when a man like Donald Trump, of all people, can put himself forward as the champion of working class people and the bringer of peace. Because as ridiculous as we know that to be, that message is too often operating in a void. And so what we're going to do with this campaign is answer that call across the five boroughs of New York City. We are going to make it clear every single day that we run this campaign, that we are running it to reshape the electoral landscape of this city and finally bring working class New Yorkers' concerns into the heart of the political debate and win. And we are going to do that by freezing the rent for more than two million rent-stabilized tenants, for every single year of the mayorality. We are going to do that by making every single bus free and fast across the five boroughs. 
And we are going to do that by bringing universal childcare to New York City, no matter if your child is six weeks of age or five years of age. And I want you to know that these proposals are just the beginning of this vision. Because every step of the way, we are going to continue to roll out proposals and policies that will ensure that working class people can afford their rent, they can afford their groceries, they can afford their childcare, and that they can in fact afford to dream. Because we have to get people off of the hamster wheel that we have left them on. We have to finally give them a life that is worth having. And I just want to tell you that you will not find those proposals and those policies emanating from me alone. You will find them from each other. You will find them just like how I found free buses from Alicia. And that is my invitation to each and every one of you, is to join this organization and to join this campaign and to understand that by doing so, you will not just help to shape the campaign, the way that we speak to New Yorkers, what we speak to them about, but also you will help to shape this city in every different way, especially in the ones we were told is impossible. So now I know, before I commit political malpractice, I was told that I have to talk about this one last section, which is that if you have yet to donate to this campaign, <laughs> I must also ask this. Because the beauty of New York City is that there is a public matching system. If you give $10 or more, it is matched eight times by the city of New York. And we want to run a campaign that is not just a left campaign, a socialist campaign, principled campaign, we also want to run a campaign that is strategic, that is disciplined, and is present in every New Yorker's life, whether they're turning on cable, broadcast, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, whatever it may be, we need to be there. And in order to do that, we need to raise a million dollars. And I'm so excited to say that we have already raised more than 240,000 of those dollars. But in order to get to the final point, in order to build the campaign that is worthy of New Yorkers' belief, one where we can say with a straight face that we deserve to have your hope, we need to continue getting and finally accomplishing that million dollar goal. And so I do ask you, there is another QR code on the paper that you are holding, where if you can donate $10 or more, please do so. And if you have a friend that you know that lives somewhere in New York City, who can't afford their rent, who can't afford childcare, but maybe they could afford $10. Ask them if they could consider to do the same. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I want to assure each and every one of you, we will have a town hall specifically on the campaign we will speak in depth about any questions that you may have because tonight is just the beginning. So please join me in welcoming Abiyanth to the stage. And if you can also join me in, in applauding both Abiyanth and everyone from DSA who put this event together, who checked you in, who had the printing, every single part of this. Thank you so much.